You're listening to Adoptee Conversations from the Adoption and Fostering Podcast. In this episode, we talk to Black Sheep. Black Sheep, who was adopted when she was a baby and has gone on to actually adopt a child herself. Obviously, her story is her personal journey through adoption. And as such, if you feel that you might be affected by some of the content, we would advise that you get a friend or a family member to screen the podcast before you listen to it yourself. Black Sheep talks to us about contact. She also talks about reunification with her birth family. As ever, if you have a story that you wish to tell, then please do contact us through social media channels, either Facebook or Twitter, and just search for the Adoption and Fostering Podcast. So for this adoptee conversation, we are joined by Black Sheep. And that is how you prefer to be, you prefer to be referred to for this, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. I did ask. <laughs> <laughs> how are you? I'm good, thank you. Yeah, good. surviving. Good, good. So um, you're quite unique in a way. Um, so this is... This is um, Why, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is going to be um, billed as an adoptee conversation, but we're going to see how it goes because you've got two sides to your kind of. I was going to say personality. That's probably not the right thing to say. <laughs> no. <laughs> two sides to your experience because you're you're, sure. you're not, you are an adoptee and you're also an adopter. Correct. But we're going to focus on the adoptee bit to start with, aren't we? Mm-hmm. See where. It, yeah. yeah. See how it flows. Yeah. Exactly. So tell us your story. Tell us, tell us, tell us from the beginning, because we're okay. Well, in the, <laughs> in the late sixties, um, I was adopted by a white family, and the story was that there were loads of children needing homes, and my parents saw an article in the Telegraph that was literally pleading for families to take up children, and my parents already had two natural sons and decided that they could give a home to a child. And in those days, there wasn't what you have now, which is almost like a database of kids available. It was pretty much rock up, see who's presented, say yes or no. That was, Mm. you know, the assessment was nothing like it was when I adopted. So my father maintains that when I was presented as this bundle in fluorescent yellow, which probably was to try and make me sort of shine out. Um, This very dark Jamaican baby was presented um, with the question of, will this one do? And my father said, yes, absolutely, she will. So I was adopted in the January. My birthday was Christmas Day. And obviously my story with my new family started there. Wow. Um, I was raised in different areas of the UK, so we moved from the north, then down to the southwest, and at that point, that's probably where my colour came into focus, because, you know, you're looking at Devon, with sort of one in a thousand children at that point being black, Um, so that was really tricky, Mm. and trying to explain that to my mother was very difficult, because she was like, oh, you know, children will be children, and, but I grew a very hard shell. Mm. Um, being the only black face in the whole primary school yeah. um, was tough for me. And I think the fact that I was adopted never really came into that because it was all the other aspects of me being different that stood out. Mm. You know, nobody really sort of questioned why I was different. In fact, when my mum adopted me, she had me in a pram and an elderly lady down the road sort of looked in the pram and said, oh, she's quite dark. <laughs> And said, and said, but her issue was, did you need another one? Oh. It, was, it wasn't like, you know, what have you done? <laughs> it was just an observation, which made yeah. sense. Yeah. And this particular lady became almost a surrogate aunt to me. And every week she would bring me a Rupert Bear book and sweets mm. without fail. So she just took me in her sights and, and took me under her wing. So I had a happy childhood. Um, everything I remember was, you know, my big brothers sort of doing rough and tumble and me sitting in the background and watching. Um, my mum and dad obviously went through the issues that they would get 
from other people looking in from the outside but there was never a key issue as to why would you adopt a black baby or you know there was none of that so I just remember being very very close to my dad um, and my mum did her mum stuff you know I always remember not being particularly affectionate with her she she wasn't a huggy sort of mum she was you know she fed us clothed us provided you know warmth and subtleties but she was never never sort of enveloped me with what I would consider what I do with my children which is just love them yeah. with, with all my soul I never really felt that I always felt yes I was the daughter that she wanted but I was maybe a bit of a project I don't know if that's mean but you know it's one of those things when I look back now I kind of wonder why they took that route because it wouldn't be allowed now for a start Mm. Um, and there was no emphasis on looking after my culture or making sure I knew where I came from. You know, there was no question I was adopted. I had mirrors in the house. <laughs> so, I mean, it wasn't like, hey, wow, how did this happen? I always knew. And even with my daughter, who you've just seen, I remember once she said to me, she was about five, and she said, um, I came out of your tummy, didn't I, Mummy? And I said, yes, you did. And she said, is that why I've got so much damn hair? And I said, yes, it is. Mm -hmm. And she said, but Granny is your mummy, but you didn't come out of her tummy, did you? So it was an observation of a very small child that made me think, that's how it is viewed. Yeah. It just is. It just is the way it is. So I want to kind of fast forward to my teens when you know you have problems with boyfriends and you you know you puberty hits and everything else and that was the time when I started getting kind of a malaise around my birthday which obviously is more difficult for me because it's Christmas mm. um, and there's more likelihood that I'm going to feel a little bit down at that time of year but it was never allowed because obviously Christmas is everyone's happy everyone's upbeat yeah. um, everyone's smiling why are you miserable sat in a corner? And I would just go in on myself because I'd be thinking, is my birth mother thinking of me? You know, is she wondering how I am? Is she alive? All of those things really dogged my teenage years, I think. Um, and I had no real outlet. I didn't know anyone else who was adopted. I had no one to sort of go, is this normal to feel this way? And it went on and on into my adulthood, I suppose. Um, and... It was almost like an unspoken thing being adopted in my family. It was never a discussion. It was never a, well, this is how it came about until I really started banging on doors. And when I was 18, I decided to start looking um, for some history. I wasn't necessarily looking for specific people. I was just looking to find out, you know, why this happened. Was I just left on church steps? I mean, you know, I had no real clue apart from the scant information that had come with me, if you like. You know, you come with a little dossier, don't you? Um, and it did seem that my mother was on site. She was very much supportive. She was, you know, she worked for the Citizen Advice. She was, I'll help you with leaflets and you go and search and I'll be here for you, etc., etc. So long story short, and if you read my book, you'd know I searched and I failed. But there were various aspects of that search that kind of, was saying to me, this isn't the right time. This is a time for you to, you know, mature. So I was very much aware that my parents really didn't think that I would ever look mm. or ever want to. So all of these long lost family stories that are all happy endings and adoptive mothers and birth mothers hugging and, you know, thank you for doing this for me, et cetera, et cetera. I don't want to say they're BS, but actually they're not the norm. The norm is it throws up a can of worms. It throws up people's insecurities. Um, am I not enough that you need to go looking and all this type of stuff? And at 18, I actually didn't give a toss. I was like, well, it's my right. I'm going to do this. You know how you are at 18. So I went through the process, didn't find what I was looking for, but found bits. So as I got older, I think I became more determined to sort of realize my history and find out you know exactly what had happened and I wasn't getting any answers within my family because it was almost like well don't tell her she's adopted you know and then she won't ask and that would never go away obviously and then another birthday would come around I'd get a little bit more sad you know and all of this would sort of drag on 
And then eventually I thought, well, I'm going to leave it because so many signs were saying that this could be damaging to you and your family and you've got to, you know, and what I tend to do is always look at other people's feelings before mine. So I took a step back and I stopped searching. Then when I had my daughter, something just clicked and I thought one day she's going to ask, how did this happen? You know, we are now two people of colour within a family that basically there's only one other coloured person in it and that's an uncle. Mm. And my mother tells me that when they took me on, they were said, oh, you know, you need to make sure that you look after her culture and she, you know, is there anyone else in the family? And my mum said, oh, yes, we've got an uncle from Ghana. Um, you know, he, <laughs> he, he kind of qualifies as somebody distant, that you know. And it was like, oh, OK, then you can have a... That's pretty much <laughs> that's pretty much how it went. Oh, so and he's lovely. Completely different parts of the world, but that's fine. Totally I mean, different. Oh, dear, yeah, dear. and he's lovely and I adore him, but it, it's, yeah. it, that was just one of those kind of like yeah. wow, <laughs> you know. So <laughs> oh, it's a bit bonkers. Yeah. So when it came to it, obviously, you know, they probably didn't really think they would have to introduce me to culture because it was one of those things as long as they were um C of, C of E, mm. my birth mother had said that's what she wanted for me. It probably never occurred to her that, you know, either race would take me on. It was just one of those things she thought, well, as long as she's not in a care home, I'd be quite happy. Yeah. And I think as an adoptee, you just kind of think the language that was used back in the 60s mm. really needed to be tempered. Right. And my mother's argument for why it is so blunt is that you weren't expected to have this you weren't expected to get this information so it shouldn't worry you and i was like well things change we've got google you know we can find these things out yeah and one of the letters that really stuck to me when i got my birth file which i was 40 probably by the time i actually went through the process with the social services one of the letters said um we have a um jamaican baby due to be born on christmas day um would your local authority have any parents likely to be interested sort of thing mm. and the answer that came back from the other local authority was potentially but you better hope that it's a girl oh. so so that kind of broke my heart because <laughs> that made me think not only did my birth mother have to pray hard that somebody would take her baby but she had to pray also it was a girl um and little black babies boys were probably less popular than girls you know only marginally but and you know you when you read that on paper you know baby 1785 you think jesus you know somebody actually wrote that without feeling and it's those things that i think the adoption system needs to change because every baby is a human being it's not just a statistic sort of thing but back then we were all statistics so the number of adoptees that I know that would say, I wouldn't know where to start to find my birth parents because I actually have no record of who I am, let alone who they are. And that's not right, you know. So I've sort of grown up thinking things need to change and how can I change them myself? I can't do a lot, but I can be a mouthpiece. So that's why the blog that I started, which, you know, sort of helps thousands of people, they message me and they say, you know, I've, I've read this latest post and it really rang true you know, different posts that I choose to write on it. Um, for instance, there was one article that I read that said, oh, you know, all these adopters, they're so good people, they're so giving, they're so, you know. And I wrote a blog that basically says, you know, we bring somebody to the party too. <laughs> you know, it's not like we don't actually have something to give. Yeah. And it is true. And somebody said to me, I'm so glad you wrote that because we are absolutely indebted to our child. Mm for giving us what we want as a family and giving us the love back sort of yeah. thing. Um, so I was going with this. So basically when it comes to addressing how you feel as an adoptee, I think the main thing is adopters have got to realize that actually it never goes away. It's not like, oh, by the time they're 16, they'll be absolutely fine. You know, it's like something I was worse over being adopted when I was 30 than I was when I was 18. Right. It hit me harder mm -hmm. because I still hadn't found her. I still hadn't got those answers. I still felt, if I don't soon, what if she's disappeared or, 
you know, and I knew she existed because I existed. Yeah. So you, you only have that to go on. Do you know what I mean? It's like, okay, well, I don't know where they are, you know, what they're doing. So when I was 40, as I say, I thought, right, I am definitely going to find her because my little girl is going to start asking questions. Why are we brown and they're not? Yeah. You know, what what's going on? So I went to my local authority, which is the standard thing you're expected to do. Mm. And they said, oh, yes, absolutely. No, we'll find your birth file. Well, I think birth file, I think that took probably about maybe three months. Now, when I went there, yeah, this is something that I have to tell you because it's hilarious. There was a um, birth mother that I found and I decided it was her and no one was going to tell me different. So... <laughs> So there was a woman, right name, right age, right. found her on Facebook. I thought, oh, my God, that was too easy. That This is amazing. You know, the gods are looking down on me. So I find this woman and I'm fixated totally. I even showed the profile to my husband who said, wow, if you age that well, mm. we're doing well. Do you know what I mean? She looks amazing. And I was like, yeah, she does. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm determined that this particular woman is my birth mother. That there's nothing going to talk me out of it. So I went to the process of with the council, I said, write to this woman first, rule her out because I'm, I'm determined it's her. And this is how you get, you know, you, you can't, unless someone eliminates themselves from your inquiries, you have to keep pursuing it. Mm. So I found out where she worked on a um, Jamaican newspaper, actually, and there's only one main one. So that was quite easy. Right. So the social worker said, well, we need to do this softly, softly. We need to write to her. Um, and we need to then give her so long to respond and we will, you know, obviously pursue her if you're convinced it's her. I said, well, I actually am. You know, I know it is her. So he wrote a letter. Now, if you imagine you don't know this person from Adam, mm. say she was called Joe Brown. The letter basically was going to Jamaica. So in my view, it needed to be trackable. It needed to be signed for when it got there. Mm. He said, no, 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 we don't send letters signed for because it can be quite a shock. So I said, so it's more of a shock to somebody getting a letter that they've just signed than it is just getting a letter and opening it. Yeah. How do you work that out? And he was like, no, 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 well, that's how we do things. I said, like, okay, fine. So he sent the letter and they charged me to send it, which was whatever. So they send this letter. Anyway, six weeks later... I'm checking my emails like every hour thinking yeah. that there'll be some feedback and the letter actually never got there. Oh. So I said, could you send me a copy of the letter you sent? Because I just need to know. And it pretty much said, Mrs. Brown, Jamaica. That was pretty much the address that they put oh. on there. Even though I had the full address of the workplace mm. that they could have used. So I said, so you expected that to go by airmail, land on the back of a goat and go off through the Jamaican Kingston town and find this woman. Yeah. <laughs> and he was like, well, you know, so I sent one myself to this woman, right? I took a punt. I thought, this is me doing my thing. So I sent it and I followed it up with an email. And then I had to get the full address and the full details. So I think it was about two in the afternoon and I thought... Right, I'm going to do this. So I had a stiff drink and I rang the number from this newspaper to get the address. And this, you know, broad Jamaican voice answers the phone. And it didn't really occur to me until after I put the phone down. I thought, oh, my God, that could have been her. What, what, yeah. <laughs> what am I thinking? This is mental. Anyway, turned out it wasn't her. And then the next person they decided was her. The council said to me, everything fits absolutely everything fits the location the you know the profile it's just the age that's different right i said so how can that fit then mm. and it worked out i would have had to she would have had to have been something like seven when she had me this woman <laughs> so this was the process going through the council hence me then doing it myself yeah. and what i actually did in the end i found through very convoluted ways i found a birth brother mm. at the last known address that the council had given me. Now, I didn't know he was a birth brother. I thought he might have been some relative with the same name. Yeah. So it was a bit of a shock because obviously I thought, well, Christ, there's a link for sure. Yeah. 
but I wasn't just going to go straight for this link. And I have a very good friend and mentor in the town where she lives. So I said to him, look, if I was to write, would you hand deliver it or, you know, make sure it gets there? Now, you imagine this is a fairly predominantly black area in Manchester and he's a big Italian white guy. And he said to me, I can, but <laughs> there could be eyes on me the minute I walked down her street. And I went, yeah, that's that's true. That probably wouldn't work then. So I went through all the process with 192.com to find the actual address. Then I figured that if she'd lived there for a length of time, people around her would know where she's gone. So I decided then to blow caution to the wind and forget about red tape and data protection because it's my data. If I want to share it, I can share it. But this is the problem with the social services. They say, well, you know, under data protection, we can't divulge your information Mm. to what could be a stranger so I had to take it in my own hands and say well I don't care because I've got no option other than doing it this way Mm. so on the 192 directory it showed that a neighbour to this property had been there for 25 years plus so I thought well she's bound to know this person has to know where where she's gone so I wrote the letter And it was pretty much my life story on paper. It was, I was born in this hospital, this ward, this date. Um, She would have been, you know, this age when she had me, blah, blah, blah. So the whole thing was just put on paper. And I wrote it to the neighbour. Now, I then set up a Skype phone number that I knew only that person would have. Right. So I set up a new number and I knew that she would then have to ring me and it would divert straight to my mobile. And I would know that that was a response to the one letter. So my man on the ground posted it first class. (laughs) I sent it to him on the the, I I sent it to him on the Saturday. He put it first class on the Monday. It landed on the Tuesday. It was within the town. Hmm. So sat here at lunchtime, minding my own business. My computer starts ringing. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, it is that Skype number. So it immediately diverted. Oh, nice cat. Immediately diverted to my mobile. And I grabbed the phone. And my little girl was probably, what was she, been five or six. Ran upstairs. She hot-footed it after me. Because, obviously, why is mummy suddenly running? Mm -hmm. So she comes running in. And then I hear this dulcet Jamaican tone saying, um, you know, this is so-and-so. I got your letter. And I'm thinking, okay. I said, so you know why I need to talk to you? And she said, of course I do. She said, you know, of course, of course I know. And I said, well, I just wanted to know if you know where she'd moved to. And she said, well, what do you mean moved? And I said, well, she would have lived there up until 2003, according to my social worker. There was no sign of her after that. And she said, no, dear, no, 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 she's not moved. She's right next door. So, obviously, I sort of went into shock, Mm. and the first thing I said was, well, is she well? And she said, absolutely, she's well. Um, You know, she'll probably have gone to work now. And I thought, Christ, it's (laughs) (laughs) 60-something. Really? Like mother by daughter, then. No, I know. So, (laughs) she sort of said, yes, dear. She said, you know, but I need you to um, obviously contact her directly, she said, because I don't really know what to do with this. Um, and she didn't really know her whole story. That was the thing. Right. So I did take that risk. So she kind of, I think, became closer to my birth mother because I divulged her story, if you like. So the funny story was that actually when the letter landed, this neighbour was unpicking my birth mother's braids. So you can picture these two black women watching Tipping Point and the letter comes through the door and she's reading it and she's like, oh, um, uh, do you know anything about this? And she goes, oh, yeah, that's my daughter. Oh, wow. So, of course, the neighbor's saying, well, you need to talk. You know, this is oh. big. This is big, big. So it turned out that actually I was the second in the queue. You know, when you have adopted children, they go like buses. You know, first one turns up, then another one turns up. And that's exactly what had happened. I had a sister, half sister, who was oh. also adopted. Okay. And she found her through a um, consultant a few months before that. Oh, wow. So obviously this poor woman is like bombarded all of a sudden with her past. Yeah. And 
what actually was weird with the whole thing was she had two sons. So I have a half brother and a full brother. Right. And the full brother was born in, in the January of the same year I was born at Christmas. So as she said to me, wow, she said, you know, how do you think I, I was pregnant? I had two babies in one year. Mm. I said, you must have a womb like a whoopee cushion. <laughs> because that's going some, basically. So then she went on to have another son. And then she went on to have another daughter by another man. Right. So another birth father. So they're half siblings. Yeah. But to me, the meltdown came when I realized that she'd kept the boys. Why hadn't she kept those girls? Right. So that was really hard to take because there was no obvious reason for that. that that was just a weird thing which i won't go into but there's a very good reason which saved our lives i think at right. the end of it so okay. but at the time you know mm. you've just found this woman and she gave you away ultimately and then did it again with another girl so the only and that girl i have been in semi reunion with and she is very bitter yeah. and she ended up sending a dear john to our birth mother after finding her which obviously was a double rejection for her which i then ended up picking up mm -hmm. you know because she was saying oh i don't know what i've done it feels like i've lost a precious jewel again and you know and i just said well i can't speak for her but maybe her curiosity is sated and that's all she wanted from the reunion um whereas what i want is a relationship so you know it, that was very different yeah now one of the reasons why it was important for me to put my story on paper is because it's a given that once you're in reunion, everybody's happy. You know, it's it's solved a mystery. It's a missing piece of the jigsaw puzzle, all of those good things. Actually, the fallout is something that you're never going to see on long lost families. You're never going to see it. But actually what happened in my case was my birth mother decided you know, that she was obviously grateful to my adopted mother. My adopted mother decided that she was now going to lose me. So it went very pear-shaped. Um, my adopted mother literally lost it and was vitriolic towards me, towards my birth mother, towards the whole setup, the whole thing. I wasn't meant to get this information. The birth file that I found was hers, wasn't mine. It was hers. I was never meant to see it. Um, you know, it took a lot of recovery mm. from that. That that was something that I had not expected. So it broke me for a long time. And all the meltdown that I had to deal with, with the issues that I found out as to why I was adopted and all those good things, yeah. that was on top of the support that I thought I had suddenly vanishing. So, you know, adoptees need to kind of be sure that that is not going to fall over when they do go searching. It shouldn't happen, and we shouldn't feel guilty for finding out what we need to know, because for health reasons, if nothing else, when I had my daughter, you know, I'm in the hospital and they're going, oh, any dietary um, requirements? And I'm like, no. Do you know if you have a history of this, this, and the other? And I don't think so. And they look at you as though you're mad, because you should know if you've got diabetes in your family. You should know. Mm. But, you know, obviously... When you find your family, then you can ascertain all those things. And now I know that it's going to be a never-ending battle over my waistline for the rest of my days. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I can stop fighting it now. <laughs> I kind of know I'm, it. Accept I'm just it. predisposed it. Yeah. to it. I, you know, <laughs> embrace it. Um, so, you know, those things are difficult yeah. because you have to kind of then almost explain yourself why did you go looking you know my elder brother who i adore had the same view as my adopted mother that was i was selfish why did i need to look for this didn't i have a perfect life and you know and it was all very upsetting because obviously you think those people are going to be on side because they've grown up with you you know they've been your support all your life and then all of a sudden you do one thing that is only about you yeah and and their reaction is but how dare you mm. you know you're upsetting the apple cart here this this is not on and you know the outcome of that now is you this kind of subtle punishments for seeking my truth and you know i remember my adoptive mother she said to me um you know had we not 
had you, had we not got you, we could have had another natural child of our own. And that's a line that will never, ever leave me. You know, I've kind of forgiven her, but actually that's almost like saying, you know, you've ruined something, you know, be grateful. And that's what angry adoptees and whatnot will say. I'm not going to be grateful because I had no choice. I didn't sign paperwork. You know, I, I didn't ask to be adopted. I'm grateful that I've had an amazing life and, you know, the quality of life I have now is testamently, testament to that upbringing. Yeah. Um, and I know life would have been really, really hard. You know, I've got half siblings who are, they have nothing. You know, that's if they're not at Her Majesty's service, they have less than nothing. Um, so I know that's an area to be grateful for, but I would have been adopted by someone else if I hadn't been adopted by them. You know, and that's the same with my boy. If we hadn't, you know, found him, fallen in love with him and gone through the process with him, someone else would have done. And I think there was a queue of people for him. So there could have been for me, yeah. you know, or they've dodged a bullet by not having well. me, but, you know, <laughs> you never know. <laughs> Who knows? So, you know, ultimately, I think at the end of a process of reunion, you then have to, unfortunately, you have to live two lives, which is what I do now. So I, at the same time as finding my birth mother, obviously I used Jeans Reunited, so there was a lot of data on there, which I used as my birth name. So I opened an account in my birth name to see if anybody would sort of find me. Mm. And pretty much the same week that I found my birth mother, the message came through that said, um, hi, are you so-and-so? I am the daughter of the birth father that you were seeking. Wow. I know. And I was like, well, I can't deal with this right now. Obviously, this mm. is both sides of the coin. Yeah. And in my naivety, I had a view of my birth father's side because he pretty much created, a, you know, a tribe of kids, um, Mr. Loverman. And it was very, <laughs> it was very much... My brain said he left my mother while she was pregnant with me. He left yeah. her when she had a baby boy. You know, I've got no, no interest in him whatsoever, but I didn't know whether this message was from somebody who had been raised by him or somebody who had been adopted. I knew nothing. So I said, just park it, leave it with me. I'll come back to you. Yeah. So a few months after I sort of got my head around my birth mother's side and learning about the siblings there, which made me one of five, um, I then went back to revisit this this girl. Anyway, the number was dead. As mobile phones change, her number had gone. So it was literally four years after that that I, in my head, suddenly thought, you know what, I'm going to look for her on um, Facebook. Okay. Just something to do, really, <laughs> and, <laughs> as you do. And she has, let's just say, a famous name. So it was pointless Googling up because she'd be on sort of page five million. Right. Um, so I found the name in Facebook and there was probably about 50. I thought, oh, God. <laughs> but something I knew was that she was from London. She lived in London. I knew my birth father resided in London and hadn't left there. He'd come to Manchester to sort of have his dalliances with my birth mother, have two children and then disappear again. Went back to London. <laughs> Um, but all his family sort of had settled there from Jamaica. Yeah. So I thought, well, I'll just take a punt. And I looked down the list of all of these people and just one stood out. There was no particular reason why it stood out. In fact, I'm not even sure if it was a picture of a person, but there was something that made me think, I think that's her. So I sent her a message and I said, some time ago you messaged me and you were looking for, um, I could be wrong, but I think you might be the person that, was looking for me, looking for you sort of thing. Yeah. So as you know, on Facebook, unless you're in somebody's Facebook, it goes into like another file. Yeah. So you have to be looking for that file. So as I say, it was literally four years mm. and she was just clearing out her box and she found my message. Wow. I know. So I'm sat watching TV, you know, got my laptop, suddenly a ping <laughs> comes up on the computer going, hi, yes, it's me. Um, I'm your sister. And I went, oh, my God, 
you know, and we chatted online probably for about an hour and a half. Wow. And we cried and she cried and it was all, you know, very emotional. It was a bit of a shock. And she's yeah. an absolutely beautiful person, very spiritual like I am. And she's very um, open, very chatty. And we're so alike. It's frightening. Oh, really? um, she's younger than me. So I'm the older sister. And then she sort of said to me, you know, there's a younger sister who she did grow up with. So she basically was raised by my birth father and her nanny. Right. And they lived in a one bedroom flat. He would go off for months on end, come back and do his thing, you know, go and have more children, come back. But there was no doubt in my mind that he loved his children wherever they were. Mm. And nanny apparently had said she wanted us, me and my siblings from Manchester mm. to go to her, but she couldn't find us. Because obviously we'd been adopted and done whatever so the conversation kind of went on and then I arranged to meet my half sisters in Bristol so we thought oh, we'll have a little spa weekend you know and it, it was all surreal because it was also normal yeah um never met these people before in my life but had spoken to them on the phone and online and there was a connection there definitely so I trundled up to Bristol they came down from London to meet me and we were all sat like in the jacuzzi and there's this family of people sat there and they sort of said oh you know how does everyone know each other and you know and we're like well <laughs> and I said well you know the we're sisters and they're like oh yeah we can tell you know it's really obvious and I said yeah we met today and they're like sorry <laughs> we're like yeah this is the first time we met <laughs> so oh. but we had an absolutely amazing weekend and ever oh. since then you know I go up a few times I've taken my daughter up you know I've got nieces and nephews and then I went up and I met two brothers who were younger than me again. And, you know, when you do that face swap thing on yeah. um, Snapchat or whatever, <laughs> well, I've discovered I actually do rock a beard, funnily enough, but, <laughs> <laughs> but they are the absolute spitting image of me. Really? One of them in particular. So my sister was saying, will you answer the door, you know, when they came? So I said, yeah, okay, fine. So I opened the door and me and one of the brothers sort of stood there for about two minutes agog like going we're looking in a mirror we are literally looking in a mirror and of course because we're all of different mothers um we're all slightly different shades mm. and we all have the same very odd sense of humor which was good and one of them said we should take a photograph <laughs> in color order you know, so that we're <laughs> like darkest to lightest kind of thing. So, you know, and it was then I just thought, actually, you know, the ice is broken. Yeah. This is a bond that we're, we're all going to have. Um, so on that side, I'm. it makes me one of 14. Wow. Yeah. Blimey. And so recently there has been communication with the oldest of all of us who lives overseas mm. and she is 10 years older than me so she messaged me on facebook and i went from being an older sister to a younger sister in like an hour and that that is completely surreal mm. and so we're all now sort of connected the boys are, are fairly kind of introvert they, they you know they don't kind of get involved with the social media stuff um but you know i'm working on it keeping them abreast of what's going on when i'm coming up and stuff like that and so i've met a cousin second cousins you know so the family is is growing and for me the best bit of that is the fact that my daughter is part of her culture as it's growing she can see why it happened and where she's from and everything else and the same with my little boy i mean you know he's mixed race different background but even so he'll be he feel part of it um so yeah so you know the happy ending is that obviously everybody has kind of become this big family that will keep growing and you know keep being nurtured but the whole journey of reunion isn't as peachy as people want to profess on you know i watch long lost families with a totally different eye to when i was looking mm -hmm. you know it's like you would know when your boy asks you questions and things there are sort of answers that will hurt him or make him you know and 
the same with long lost families. They only show the stuff that they want people to feel warm and gooey over. But I think they should be kind of an opposite show that actually says shit can hit the fan, you know, this, this could happen, which is what my adoptive mother was saying to me regularly. Oh, you be careful. You don't know what you're going to find. This is kind of worms. You know, you might find something you don't want. They might not be nice people. And there are skeletons in the closet that I found, um, you know, and in her head, she pretty much admitted that she would have preferred it if I found an obituary. You know, and I'm not going to lie, that hurt, because when I was looking for her, I was searching the obits as well as everything else. And I would go to bed, you know, bottle of wine later thinking, well, I didn't find her dead, so she still exists. You know, and you go through all of that searching and it's heartbreaking. So fast forward to now, in the last about a year and a half ago or a year and a month ago, my birth mother, who is like me, very chatty, very gregarious, um, you know, very open, would answer any questions that I'd ask. Mm. She had a brain hemorrhage and unfortunately was left unable to speak. So she has been in hospital ever since and has had a recent um, seizure that's meant that she can no longer swallow and she has a tracheostomy. So I've been up several times and it's heartbreaking. It's not a jolly, you know, I've been up. And what gets me most is that she won't be able to tell me anything else. And that, that for me is almost like losing her, even though she's still there in the physical yeah. sense. And I can't share that because... It's like saying, well, she's not dead, but actually I can't gain more information about me or my history unless I want to venture into her family, which is a thin end of the wedge of kind of whether that's safe or not for me. Mm. So it's kind of a happy but sad ending, I guess. So, you know, we, we just kind of have to sort of take the good with the bad. Yeah, but, but I, I would say you know most adoptees are lucky to kind of be able to look back and find history mm. I do pity the ones that kind of think they don't need that information and go to their grave without it because actually you do need it you know it, it's important for me that I can understand when my boy sort of says you know I hate you you're not my mum you know, all this type of stuff. Yeah. I can say, I know exactly where you're coming from. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and yeah, you hate me and yeah. I'm not your mum, but I'm the only mum you've got. Yeah. Yeah. And we're going to work through it together, you know, and I will help him find what he needs to know. Mm -hmm. um, how long have we got? You're going to cut me off in a minute. No, we've got age. No, we've got age. Oh, okay. Yeah. I've got loads of questions for you. because oh, I, I mean, literally, I said to you beforehand, didn't I? I said that this is your conversation, so you lead it. So I'm not okay. going to ask questions until you finish speaking. Okay. It could well be we'll be here at midnight. I don't know. <laughs> <Cool>. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> That's okay. But, yeah, so when we um, – I'll touch on, obviously, adopting, if you like. When we adopted our little boy – we had an amazing assessment. You know, I actually quite enjoyed it. It was very intrusive. And obviously, you know, as you know, it really they need to scratch every surface and dig deep and all the rest of it. So you go through all of that. But we really enjoyed the social workers working for him. Our own were kind of hit and miss, I suppose, because we had two or three. But when we had him, I'll probably get shot for this, but when we got him... Um, we had always said, you know, we knew he had a half-sister. Now, I obviously have recently been reunited with half-siblings, and it blows your mind. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm in my 40s, so, you know, that's hard. Mm -hmm. So to imagine a little one trying to understand why he's moved into a family after however months in foster care, and he has a sibling and older siblings in my family... So the social services decided that it would be a really good idea to have him and his sister adopted separately, which was their decision, not ours. And it got me thinking, actually, all of these things are just to plant trauma into a child who was already, you know, we were his trauma. He was quite happy 
you know, removed from birth, went into foster care. We were the trauma. We rocked up. We were family. And then he had a six-hour drive. He'd never been in a car. So you can imagine that went really well. Mm, um, yeah. But one of the funniest things was the panel, and anyone adopting will probably relate to this, you know, you've got 12 people who you're never going to see again who have a judgment on you. Um, and they've decided, yeah, they've decided whether or not you're going to have this child before you've even emptied the room sort of thing. Yeah. And they're going to give you the child. You know, you've been matched. The system is such that they're not going to say no. So I don't know what people are always putting on Facebook. You know, I'm so nervous. I've got panel. What if they say no? They're not, not going to say no because the process has cost an absolute fortune to get you to that point. They're only going to say no if you don't turn up. Unless there's a massive issue. Uh, but unless you turn if, up. And they, if, if there's an issue at that point, then there's something gone far. Well, yeah, if, yeah. In, unless they sort of say, oh, you know, we've just been given a document that says that you're a serial killer, so we really can't give you this child. You're going to get that child. So we're sitting there, and the panel chairwoman, she's she's sort of one of these, you know, she does this. She goes, repeatedly, you know, so she makes you a little bit anxious because she can't, she doesn't know what to do with her glasses. Anyway, she said, um, she said, oh, I just want to say, I just want to point this out. She said, I'm not sure um, that the baby has seen very many black faces. So, I swear to God. So, <laughs> so she said, so... Don't be upset or anything if he sort of freaks out when when he sees you. And I thought, okay. So, and of course, there was an audible gasp around the table, particularly from the Punjabi medical doctor there, who just thought, oh, "We're going to get sued." I mean, that there's just no going back from that comment. And you know, I sort of sat there calmly, and I think my husband sort of squeezed my knee. As if to say, just easy, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> stick up. And I was absolutely gobsmacked. And I said, presumably, as this child is mixed race and in a London borough, there are going to have been people of different, you know, nationalities, etc., that he's encountered. And if there haven't been, you need to sort that out. Because you know, you're not doing him any favours if, if you think that's the case. And I said, and to be quite honest, um, I'd be amazed if he freaks out because he's already seen my photo mm -hmm. from the things that we sent up, you know. So afterwards, of course, the social workers were going, oh, my God, oh, my God, you know, don't say anything. Let's get through this before, you know, it hits the fan sort of thing. And, you know, and I said, well, babies don't see colour. She saw colour, but a baby's not going to. And he took to us instantly you know all of us because he just knew our voices by the time we went up you know and there was an instant bond but it, for me it was just something else to worry about thank you very much you've just given me another little anxiety to think about before we go all the way up and meet this child and i think they've got to be very mindful of stuff like that a panel you so, know because I'm just conscious of time, yeah. and I don't want to cut you off, but language has come up a little bit in a couple of places with this conversation, because the language of when you were adopted, and obviously language now. So language is still an issue, and is it, is it an issue because we're constantly learning, we're evolving, or is it, what, 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 how would you describe that? Because you mentioned earlier on the, the, the language that was used when you were a child. Mm. And, and I get that completely because we would never even dream of using that sort of language. Now. No. And even now, you know, mm. there's some things when people point it out, you go, actually, I get that. Mm. So what, what is it? Is it just learning or is it just? I think it's people from maybe a generation who have this view that say it how it is. And then there's no misconstrued, you know, assumptions, you know, people will sort of say, is it all right if I call you black? Mm. And you go, well, yeah, why wouldn't it be? <laughs> you know, or I'd, I'm not sure if I, you know, and I think, well, that's embarrassed you, not me. Yeah. And it's a, it's a shame because do say it how it is, but actually own it. Mm -hmm. You know, if you say something and someone's offended by it, yeah. own the fact you've offended them. Don't kind of 
try and recoil as if to say, well, how dare you be offended? I only meant what was PC or, yeah. you know, when you hear all this sort of stuff about, um, you know, you can't have Barbar Black Sheep in nursery rhymes yeah. and things like mm-hmm. that. It's mm-hmm. like, well, I call myself Black Sheep. Yeah. You know, the people who published my book, they sort of said it's one of the best, most apt book titles we've ever seen. <laughs> you know, Black Sheep Sweet Dreams, because I am black and I am the black sheep of the family. And life isn't a sweet dream. So it was a very kind of, it came to me in a flash, you know, it was one of those things. But people would be offended and go, oh, I don't think she should call herself black sheep, maybe brown sheep. Mm, that's an interesting one, isn't it? Because it's yeah. up to you what you call I'm yourself. calling, yeah, don't yeah. be offended on my behalf. Yeah, no, because yeah. That, that's ludicrous. I mean, when we first yeah. died, I said to you, how do you want me to refer to you? And you said black sheep. And I'm like, oh, uh, but, but that's <laughs> only because, I yeah, but that's only because, I mean, you know, I come across this day and day out as well with the gay thing, because, you know, mm. some, some like to call themselves queer or, um, you know, all those kind of different yeah. um, names that they can call themselves. So I guess... Mm. My issue is, mm. like you've just said, it's my issue. It's not your issue. Yeah, yeah. So don't don't pass but, your yeah exactly your kind of insecurity over how you yeah. should behave towards me onto me because yeah. it, it's I don't have a problem with it. Yeah. And I think some of the way that things were written, mm. it was um, you know the language was very seventies. It was very, and yeah. mm-hmm. um, you know, it's kind of still very racist in this country yeah. back then. Yeah. yeah. So, as far as my birth mother was concerned, she would have been pretty much the lowest of the low in this country. You know, she came over when she was 15. Yeah. Um, she came and her mother kind of disowned her. She had a mother and a brother. They sort of disowned her as soon as she got pregnant a second time. Wow. And there were no real benefits. You know, she was quite religious. So there was, you know, the question of contraception probably didn't even enter her head. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's the language I hear about her now from people going, well, she should have known better after she'd had the first one or blah, blah, blah. And I'm thinking, you know nothing about her, yeah. nothing about her circumstances. That's like saying to somebody, um, you know, okay, you've had five kids, that's enough. Mm-hmm. You're not going to say that to somebody. And so you can't really say to somebody what to do with those children when they have them. The circumstances for everyone vary. But on paper, the social services are just like, this woman has an illegitimate child. Um, You know, do you have anyone that would be willing to take it? You know, and then when you read that about yourself, you know, you're that it. Mm -hmm. And you think, wow, that's that's quite hard. That's hard to read. And I don't think it's improved that much. I mean, we've had the Later Life Letter, Mm -hmm. um, Never Had the Life Story book, which is a gripe that I'm not even going to go into, but... We had the letter. Tonight. I don't think we've got enough time to go into uh, this <laughs> But we had the letter, and it's written very childlike. Oh, really? I feel it. It's very wow. childlike, and it doesn't really say anything. It doesn't say very much. And when he's older, he's going to feel it's very childlike. Right. And maybe question why he wasn't shown it as a child. You can understand it now. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I read it, and I think... Do I read it to him or do I just tell him the information I know that he understands from me mm-hmm. or show him this letter that then goes, well, who's that? What, what do you mean social workers? You know, for a child growing up in a family that they feel they belong, that's what they should feel. All of the, a lot of the sort of groups that are set up are about, you know, mix with all these adopters and your children should mix with all these adopted children. I didn't want that growing up. I didn't want to feel different. I didn't want to be singled out. Oh, look, there are all the adopted children, you know, on a fun day. You know, it's a nonsense to me. Children are children. You know, he mixes with all his friends, all his family. The same with my daughter. You know, she's very popular, very gregarious, you know, cheeky. And she will have a mix of friends. She wouldn't know if any of them adopted or not. She wouldn't have a clue. Right. And why should she have? You know, it's the stigma is pointing out those children as being different. That's where the stigma stays. If we get rid of that and it's just another, you know, you were born either of those two parents or of someone else, end of. You know, it's not kind of a, you know, let's look at what the social services can do to make life better for adopted children. Make them normalised. You know, stop singling them out. Then you wouldn't have all these angst things going on on Twitter. 
where you can't say something positive about your adoption because someone will jump on you and say, yes, but that's just you. That's not everybody. Obviously, it's not. I can't speak for everybody. I can only speak for myself. But it just amazes me the number of people who will jump on you and go, you have no right to say these positive things because it's not my way. You know, my life was was upsetting and I get it and I sympathize and I have a lot of friends on there. But I do sometimes feel there's a very bullying culture and we're all adopted. So we're all the same. We should actually all be pulling together and not picking off little factions of adoptees as though some views are more valid than others. You know, all our views are valid, whether you have a positive experience or negative. And as I say, because I'm an adopted adoptee, it's pretty hard to know what camp to sort of poke me with a stick in, you know. But I think that's an interesting point, actually, Um, and 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 an interesting perspective, because I always see it as there's all these different sides to adoption. So we've got adoptive parents, we've got the adopted person. Mm-hmm. Let's say person, because at the yeah. end of the day, a baby is going to grow. It becomes a person. <laughs> it yeah. becomes an adult. Yeah. Um, and then we've got birth families. And the, the, I think they call it the adoption triad, don't they, in some, some places. But actually... It's we, this. Yeah. You can see my tattoo. I don't know if you can see it on there. You probably can't, but it's the triangle. Um, yeah, the triangle with the love yeah. heart, isn't it? That's, That's one. Yeah, because yeah. my little man always draws. He draws tattoo designs for everybody, and it always oh, has a, a heart and a, and a triangle. Bless his heart. I know. Yeah, I haven't had it done yet. I might do one day. Anyway, yeah, um, go for it. but um, the, my point with this is that you know, there's th- we have willing people. Excuse me, who um, who want to who want to share their experiences, whether mm-hmm. they're good or bad or you know whatever but actually if we all work together as a as as a community because we are a community of course you know i don't get me wrong 13 years ago when i adopted my older two we were kind of a segregated community sure. in the way that there was a child there was a family there was us and mm. us us and the child would come together and the birth family were pushed away because there was this concern about the the, the the bonding and the attachment and sure. giving them a yeah. childhood and uh, you know but mm. actually we have learned so much over time that you know it's changing it is mm. it's evolving and and I'm, I'm kind of with you on that because i think that you know there's so many opportunities to try and get this right for future generations yeah. you've had your struggles you know mm. the people that have issues on twitter or you know wherever they have their struggles, but actually, mm. if we were just to kind of go, let's take a deep breath. Let's let's see how. What is the commonality between us all? Well, mm. there's one thing, isn't it? A and child. It's just, you know, that's it. Mm. That's it. But I think also the community has to sort of recognise that the adopter and the birth family. If, if for argument's sake, my mother mm. had met my birth mother. Mm-hmm. She yeah. wouldn't have felt as threatened by her child seeking the truth. <clears throat> so, you know, I wanted to meet the birth mother of my child, mm. <clears throat> but she decided against it. Right. Um, which, you know, was not a safety thing. It was just her lifestyle. Yeah. She didn't want to, which was fine. Mm-hmm. But I think that would have helped him down the line by me saying, well, you know, we met we had a conversation about how we were going to look after you and we were going to raise you and et cetera, et cetera. And she gave her blessing. I think that should almost be part of the assessment. Yeah. It's not always possible because obviously the safety aspects with some of the parents, you know, if children are removed, Mm -hmm. but down the line, perhaps the social services could be looking at a way to actually say these children that are sort of fostered to adopt. I mean, there's a massive issue around some of these children going back isn't that after they've been fostered to adopt and they've had sort of introduction throughout the whole process of that assessment so you've got people adopting who pretty much have to liaise with the birth family Uh when they take this child on and that's probably healthier down the line to explain to the child that you know we have not a friendship but an understanding Uh so it's not kind of such a stigma of 
these people are a threat to you if you go looking for them or a threat to the adopters if you go looking. Because that's why we carry so much guilt as adopted people. We carry guilt from the minute we realise we're adopted to death, if you like, because we actually know that we have to have this in our lives as well. Mm. That doesn't make us selfish, doesn't make us greedy. It just means that missing piece of the jigsaw. If you imagine you're born of your parents, you know where you've come from, you know, you look like them, you've got all the kind of characteristics physically as well as sort of the nature nurture thing. Mm. If you're adopted, you have none of that. So you need to know where did I get this personality? Where, you know, because I am 100% different from my family. You know, they're all very intellectual, very um, quite highbrow, you know, very good education. I'm kind of artistic, mouthy, streetwise, you know, say it how it is, very emotional. You know, they're very sort of unemotional. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I love them dearly. But we are so much different. So when I find my own blood and they're exactly the same as me, that's got to be a valuable thing for me to pass down to my child. Yeah. It has to be. I mean, there's no way you could look at that and say it's a negative. Mm. So I do think it's a shame that the kind of whole helping people find their birth family is still looked upon as, you know, somebody's taking something away from someone else when they're really not. Mm. And and that kind of makes me sad when I see these reunion stories on Twitter when people have sort of said, oh, you know, I was abused. I had a, as worse a life from being adopted than had I not been. And, you know, they don't actually know that. And they're very sad, but they're not in any way any different from people who aren't adopted. You know, those people don't go on Twitter and say, you know, I was abused through my life and I blame X. Whereas these people I abused through my life and I blame adoption. Do you see what I mean? It's kind of a, you can't put an umbrella over it all and blame that on everything that happens to you in your life. I'll probably get absolutely trolled now. But, you know, that's just my view. Yeah. Well, so, but it's your view and that was the whole point of you exactly. sharing your story because it's exactly. your story and not anybody else's. Yeah. On that note, black sheep, mm -hmm. I'm going to switch this off. Because we could, I, I, I'll just say, I knew the first time I met you two years ago that if I ever spoke to you again, it would be in this capacity and I would never shut you up. And I was, I was right. So, you know. I'm very you. <laughs> but you know, you know me too well to know that I, I am joking. So, I um, but um, uh, thank you so much for sharing your story. My pleasure.